Hi everybody, I'm back and I want to do a little demonstration of the software Seismo signal for you. I like to do this uh, usually in class, but because we have some guests from Japan on uh, the regularly scheduled class on Friday, uh, I'm probably going to be canceling class that day so that you guys can go and attend the short course that they'll be providing. Um, so Seismo Signal is what you download from the website um, seismosoft.com and uh, like I mentioned before in the previous video you can get the uh, activation for that if you send them your academic email. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the Seismosoft folder and I'm going to down or open up Seismo Signal. So I've got version 5.1.2 I think that they have a newer version out now it's going to be very similar to this one though <clears throat> and I, I do want to apologize for any background noise that you hear during this little lecture um, I'm recording this while I have my um, daughter and my wife at the gym and I'm hiding in a corner <laughs> trying to give this uh, tutorial for you before I head out to San Francisco early tomorrow morning so this is what Seismo Signal looks like um, it's, it's very straightforward you can see lots of big buttons up here uh, I don't really know what most of these buttons do, uh, though it wouldn't take long to figure it out. Uh, let's go ahead and open up a time history file to show you what happens. Now, time history files, they're usually digital recordings from accelerographs, and so they're going to have a whole series of acceleration values with time. Uh, so, Seismo Signal has its own DAT file or data file format and um, so you can convert files into its own format we're not going to worry about that right now but I'll go ahead and open up one of the files so this is going to be a Kobe record from the 1995 earthquake and what happens is it has this input file parameters window that pops up the text file is down in this window below and you see me scrolling here in the DAT format, there's two columns. The first column is time. So this is, uh, you can see it starts at zero seconds and it's going in increments of 0 0.01 second. And then the second column is the acceleration value that corresponds with that time. So what we tend to do then is we just have to go ahead and indicate all these different values. <clears throat> if I um, put my cursor on the first line of data, I can see right down here um, where my arrow is pointing, it says line number 6. So I want to make sure that the first line here is line 6. And the last line, you know, if I want to get it precise, I can scroll down to the last line of data. And that would be line 4096. Alternatively, I could just put something really, really big and um, then Seismo Signal will go ahead and find the last line on its own. You just want to make sure that you don't specify a last line that is less than the last line of the text file. Uh, and then uh, the time step is important here. Um, in this data format we don't really need to worry about it because um, we can see the time step in these columns here where um, we can see that the time step is at 0 0.01 seconds. Scaling factor would be if we want to apply a uniform uh, multiplier to the acceleration time history, like multiply it by a factor of 2 or 0 0.5 or something like that. We're just going to leave it at 1 uh, for this exercise. These different radio buttons that you see here are the different possible formats we could see. Um, in general, never select single acceleration value per line. Only select time and acceleration value per line or multiple acceleration values per line. Um, in this file down here, we have time and we have acceleration, you can see. So we're going to select time and acceleration values per line. It wants to know which of the data columns is acceleration. It's column number two and which of the columns is the time column and, and in this case it's column number one so with that then uh, I think we're ready to go oh uh, we can change the units too if we wanted to 
you go in and change it. We have it right now in units of G for acceleration, centimeters per second for velocity, centimeters for displacement. <clears throat> you can see how we could change the units to anything we wanted. I'm just going to hit OK. And it's telling me, oh, you said go to line 10,000, but I hit the end of my file at line 4,097. That's fine. So there we go. So the top plot is the acceleration time history. The middle plot is the velocity time history. And the bottom plot is the displacement time history. Now, all of these records that uh, are in SeismoSignal come from the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center. And they've already been baseline corrected and filtered. Uh, so I won't be demonstrating that, at least with this time history. But uh, I'll open up another one in a few minutes and show you how that's to be done. Uh, so we can look at it either as a plot or we can look at the data in data format. One of the cool things about the data format is you can copy and then paste it in Excel if you want to do your own plots. Uh, up here you can see the different um, tabs that allow us uh, to play with the data. If we wanted the baseline, correct it, or filter the time history, we would press the first tab. Uh, I'm not going to mess with this on this time history, but I'll come back to it in a few minutes. Time series is kind of the default tab. That's where we can plot everything. If I wanted to look at the Fourier spectrum, um, I can look at it right down here on the bottom. It automatically computes the Fourier spectrum. So you can see the different frequencies that are really, really high. So we have uh, a lot of really high frequency this is just noise that I don't think is legitimate. I think this is probably stuff that should have been filtered out, but wasn't. Uh, but you can see from the earthquake uh, at a frequency of about, what, 0.8 seconds, 0.7 seconds is kind of our peak. And so that's uh, most of the uh, sinusoidal motions in this Kobe earthquake seem to correspond with that 0.7 second uh, sine wave. If you want to compute response spectra, you go to the next tab here, and this is the elastic, inelastic response spectra. We can set it up to have period, frequency, or displacement on the x-axis. Uh, for this class, we'll always have period. Uh, and then we can, on the y-axis, we can plot the response spectrum in terms of peak displacements, velocities, accelerations, etc., etc. So we'll go ahead and plot the acceleration response spectrum. And uh, here's where we enter our damping value. Uh, right here, the viscous damping, we have 5%. If I wanted to add you know, another damping value, uh, maybe 10% or others, we, we could go ahead. But for right now, I'm just going to have the 1. And uh, I'm going to refresh it. And so there you go. This then represents the maximum acceleration from a series of single degree of freedom oscillators that correspond to different and increasing periods. And so um, you can adjust you know, the response spectrum and play with it here and then see kind of the different things it can do. Uh, but it, it is quite a bit of fun. OK. Um, finally, I want to take you to the ground motion parameters tab. And this is going to be a useful tab for you because SeismoSignal computes all of these different ground motion parameters for your benefit. Um, you can see in this upper window on the left max peak acceleration, that's uh, max acceleration, that's PGA and the time of the maximum, PGV, max velocity, max displacement, Vmax over Amax, all these different ground motion parameters we talked about. Look, it even computes the area's intensity for you, um, the cumulative absolute velocity, all of these things it computes. And then it will also plot areas intensity with time and percent areas intensity with time. And so here uh, in the middle plot is the plot of areas intensity as a percentage with time. This is a really useful plot because it shows you the run up of energy uh, from the earthquake ground motion. The steeper this run-up of areas intensity, that means the faster the earthquake uh, 
introduced energy to the system, uh, the slower the run up, the slower the earthquake is introducing energy to the system. So these plots uh, are going to be really useful to us later on when we look at um, manipulating time histories. So all the ground motion parameters you could ever want are up here in this window. And um, one of the really nice things is, of course, you don't have to compute it. The program does it for you. Okay, so I want to um, demonstrate baseline correction and filtering for you. So let's go ahead and go to the homework that you guys are going to be assigned. Um, I believe it's uh, homework number four. And in homework number four, I give you this time history from uh, an earthquake in Turkey. And you can see that the data format down here looks different than the format that we had before from the DAT file. And that's because this is just a different data format. So um, I want to make sure that I enter all the right inputs. So my data starts on line three, as you can see down here at the bottom of the window. My data starts on line three of the text file. Uh, again, I can go down to the bottom of the text file. The data ends on line 1,120, but I'm just going to leave it at 10,000. Now, in this data format, this little number here, this decimal number, that's my time step. So I want to make sure that that number right there in blue matches this number in blue in my time step box, which it does conveniently for this case. Uh, I'm going to leave my scaling factor at 1. Now, I need to switch from a time and acceleration value per line to just multiple acceleration values per line. Down in, in this data file format, there is no time in the data. All of these are just acceleration values at a time step of 0 0.01. Um, finally, uh, this value that says frequency, always leave that at 1. This, it, if you change it to 2, what that means is you're going to take every second acceleration. Um, so just leave it at 1, and that means you're going to plot every single acceleration. And then it's going to ask initial values skipped. We don't really want to skip any initial values, so we'll just put that to 0. And then I'm going to hit plot. Let's go back to the time history so you can see it. Now check this out. The acceleration time history looks fine from this Turkey earthquake, but we see a little bit of drift in the velocity record. And, and we see drift because where you see my arrow to the right, the velocity time history does not end on zero. It ends just a little bit above zero. And so when that gets integrated to displacement, Look what happens to the displacement plot. We get a ton of linear drift. So this is a time history that would need baseline correction. So we're going to go to the baseline correction tab and we're going to apply a baseline correction and we're going to apply some filtering as well. Um, now the homework may say just apply a baseline correction and if that's the case go ahead and just do that. Um, in fact uh, well, just for demonstration, I'll apply the filtering so that you can see. And I'll also want to plot the uncorrected results so that we can see if we really screwed the record up with the filtering. Baseline correction doesn't really screw the record up too much, but filtering can if you're not careful. So we're going to leave the filtering at the default of uh, the, the um, low pass at the 0.1 frequency and the high pass at the... T or, uh, 0.1 hertz and the high pass at the 25 hertz. We're just going to leave that as it is. And it's a Butterworth filter. We're going to do a linear baseline correction. So if I hit refresh, here it goes. Down on the plot on the bottom, the blue is the new time history and the gray is the old time history. So you can see there's just a little bit of difference there in the acceleration time history, but not enough to really make me worry. There's really good overlap between most of the acceleration values. But now look what happens if I go back to the time history. Look at my displacement time history now. You can see that it um, really straightened out and it ends on zero just like we want, and the velocity time history ends on zero as well. 
but check out how the velocity time history changed. Um, it changed quite a bit because of the filtering. And the displacement time history changed a little bit too, but more the velocity time history. That's what happens when you apply filtering. It will alter your time history. Let's go back and reload it. Um, everything should be correct. So if I go ahead and reload it, so I'm back to my original. Um, let's uh, try this again, but this time I'm not going to use the filtering. I'm just going to do the baseline correction. So you can see now it's a much better fit on the um, acceleration time history. And if I go back, um, we have a little problem. If you look at the displacement time history, you see that the displacement time history kind of warps its way up and then eventually warps its way back down to zero at the very end of the time history. The displacement time history should be oscillating back and forth around zero, not have this big constant value. So that's not going to work. Um, I might try a quadratic uh, baseline correction and see what happens. And that's a little bit better, but you see how now here in the displacement time history it comes up and then it comes back down below zero and now it comes back up again. Uh, so that's just not working for me. Uh, I'll try one last one and do a cubic. And I'll come back and look at the displacement time history and it's still kind of wobbly up and down, up and down. Uh, but it, it, it's better. I, we could probably live with it. But the only way we're going to get rid of, rid of this wobbliness is if we go ahead and apply that filter. So watch what happens when I apply that filter. Now you see the displacement time history centered right around zero displacement going up and down, up and down, and it ends right smack on zero. And so um, for this time history, yeah, you probably want to make sure you apply the filter in addition to the baseline correction and that's how we get that nice corrected look so um, go ahead and, and watch this tutorial and I hope that you take a chance to um, practice with Seismo Signal while you're watching this tutorial and uh, you're going to be using this program quite a bit in this class so get comfortable with it if you have any questions go ahead and let me or let Alex know and we'll be happy to help you out so thanks folks and have a wonderful day.